We're going to talk about who is the Holy Spirit tonight. I want us to begin in Acts chapter 2. It's a very familiar passage. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it set on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Now that's the King James Version. I want you to notice it calls it the Holy Ghost. I'm going to get to that as we get on into this lesson, the, the ghost part of that. But we know what happened on that day of Pentecost. That these men stood and began to preach in languages where people from, from all over the Roman world had come for the day of Pentecost, and they heard them speak in their own language. And they wondered, what is going on? And Peter talked about Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of prophecy, the resurrection from the dead. We are witnesses of these things and said, this explains what you now see and hear. That coming of the Holy Spirit in that manner was the evidence that what they were preaching was of God. Well, 3,000 were baptized that day. They were added to the church. And as they went home, they carried the gospel with them. And the apostles followed what the Lord said to preach the gospel in all the world. And the church came into being. And we are still preaching and extending that word to this day. Now, let me take you to the American colonies. And this is uh, before the Revolutionary War, when we were still colonies, and many had come to New England early with great religious fervor, but we're about the third or fourth generation from them, and the religious fervor had greatly dropped. And then it seems like out of nowhere, people were having emotional responses to the preaching. They would feel like something had gotten them and they were in very, uh, very sedate worship service. People would stand up and start yelling and they would fall down and, and they didn't know what was going on. And word of this spread and where the word of this spread, this, this excitement went all over the, the colonies and... Uh, it's called in history the, the Great Awakening. And they were attributing the emotional responses of that preaching to the Holy Spirit. It's, it's one of the things that is that spread across the colonies and people say a lot of the colonies were founded on religious principles. But this, this phenomenon cut all across all religious ideas and everyone was together in this experience. And historians say that's one of the things that, that made the colonies think of themselves not as individual colonies, but as a nation. And that later led to that idea of we can unite and become our own nation. They say that was part of that influence. Okay, now let me take you to 1805. Cane Ridge, Kentucky. And again, the religious fervor of the country had, had greatly dipped, and it was really depressed. And then suddenly, where Barton Stone was the preacher... In Cane Ridge, Kentucky, they had a camp meeting. And people started pouring in from all over. And preachers started showing up from all over. And they were preaching all over the area and word of the spread and more and more people were coming to Cane Ridge, Kentucky. And some of the behavior became very outlandish. People were shouting and crying and falling and rolling around and acting like they were dead for hours at a time and climbing up trees and barking like dogs and growing like roosters and just doing all kind of bizarre things. And people were attributing that emotional response 
to the Holy Spirit. And these all different denominations coming together and working together in this. And then as it began to die out, they were trying to pull people into their own denominations and separate again. That's one of the reasons Barton Stone thought, wait a minute, wait a minute. If we can all get together during this revival that we had, why can't we stay together? And how? what would be the basis of us to unify? And so Barton Stone started preaching about that time, said, we can unite on what the Bible says and let the Bible be our standard and drop all this denominational division that we had. And he became a great preacher. And that led, uh, uh, that influence continues to this day on restoring New Testament Christianity by returning to the scriptures. Now let me take you to Wilmore, Kentucky. This was last February. There's a little college there called Ashbury, named for the, the great Methodist preacher that, was, uh, that had come over to help organize the Methodist church in America. And they have a daily chapel service, and that sort of reminds me of what happens at Fred Hardeman University. And someone got up and preached a uh, inspiring sermon at that daily chapel service, and, and that's what happens in those chapel services. They'll have a guest speaker come in. But when it was over, some of the students decided they didn't want to go to class. They would just stay in the assembly room, and they would sing hymns, and they would pray. And so it was a handful of students doing this, and other students heard about it, and they came and joined them, and they did this all that day and all that night, and they were still doing it the next morning. A word began to spread, and other people decided, I want to see what's going on here. And people started coming to that Ashbury University, to that particular assembly hall, and they said, in the next two weeks, tens of thousands of people were gathering together at Ashbury to sing and to pray and to testify. And it was quite an emotional thing. You may remember hearing about this. It was considered an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> I have been asked to preach in a gospel meeting in Paris, Illinois. Now, while this is going on in Ashbury, by the way, here's, here's what happened to that, that event at Ashbury. It continued two weeks. The university wasn't able to function and the town wasn't able to function. They were out of groceries. They were out of gas. They were in traffic jams. It's just a little town. They weren't equipped for all of this. And the university decided we've got to, we got to put an end to this on campus. And so they stopped it on campus. A group moved off of campus and continued for another nine hours. And then they, they just wore out with it, and it just disbanded. And one of the things that bothered them was people started teaching, and they were saying they were getting these words from the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit wants me to say this, and the Holy Spirit, and this testimony. One man showed up in a wheelchair and got out and walked across the stage and said he just got healed by the Holy Spirit. And they were teaching different things. And one of the fellows that had organized this off campus, he explained it this way. He said, well, the spirit is moving in the lives of different people in different ways. And that explains the different teachings that people were giving. Now, they're up in Paris, Illinois. And they had asked me, do you have a theme for your gospel meeting? Well, I sent them a, a number of things that I could do. So I said, you pick something you think would be appropriate for you. And I sent several ideas up there that they could use. And they went back and said, well, we just had a study on the Holy Spirit and we're confused 
could you come talk to us about the Holy Spirit? So this September, I'm going to go to Paris, Illinois, and right now I've got six times to preach, and I'm going to try to talk to them then about what the Bible teaches about the Holy Spirit. I'm going to use some of my Sunday nights to kind of help me get get ready for this. I went over a lot of this material. It must have been seven years ago when, when I did this, and I'm going to review some of that. So I'm going to start off this way for that Sunday school class. And I'm going to do this as though it's one long sermon. I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'll just preach till the time's up and I'll put a stop. So we'll come back to this, then that next one, and just let it be one long sermon preached over at least a, uh, six or seven times. I'm thinking about doing this, that Wednesday night at the end of the meeting, just let that be a question and answer time. And ask people while I'm speaking, now if you've got questions about the Holy Spirit, write that down, and then I'll try to address those questions in that last night. Not because I know everything about it, I'm not, I'm not that way, but uh, I think I can help with some understanding. And a lot of the times the questions that come up are, are very similar questions that I, I think I'm going to know the kinds of questions they would ask. And if they don't, then I've got my own questions. I'll just present my own questions and answer them and, and let the meeting in that way that Wednesday night. But I'm going to begin that Sunday school on who is the Holy Spirit. And that's one of the first things we've got to understand about the Holy Spirit. We're introduced to the Holy Spirit very early in the Scriptures. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Again, this is the King James Version. That is a very simple sentence in the English but when you start digging down and you start getting into the Hebrew language, there's a lot of depth in that very simple sentence. Let me give you an example. The kind of things you discover when you bore down into this. There's an untranslatable particle in that Hebrew verse. And I've got the particle up there. That first little letter in the yellow it's in the beginning God created the, now here's something, heaven, and the something, earth. Now, th this can't be translated. It's not a word. Those two letters there are from the Hebrew alphabet. Now, now the Hebrew, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to be careful not to get too far off subject. We write from, uh, from left to right. You know, when we're writing, left to right. Hebrew doesn't do that. Hebrew goes from right to left. And I've heard it explained, if you're trying to chisel in a stone, that would be the, the way to go, that way. It'd be more awkward to try to do it this way. So you kind of, well, that might be the reason that it goes from, uh, from right to left. But those two letters, starting with the letter on the right, it's Aleph. And that letter on the left is Tau. And that is the first and the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's not really a word, it's a tag of some sort to say, okay, this word, uh, you're tagging that word something. In the beginning, God created the, and then heaven is tagged, and then earth is tagged. Now, why they're tagged, I don't know, but but the fact that that is the first and the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet has led some to suggest that this means God created everything in the heavens and everything on the earth. And indeed, that's what Moses is later going to write when he's giving the Ten Commandments, God giving that to Moses, and says in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11, In six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. You, we might say all the way from A to Z. Now, let's go a little further. Something else that surprised me when I dug into this little first verse, in the beginning God, it's singular in the English, 
In the Hebrew, the word is plural. Why would that be plural? Well, a lot of the time you would make a word plural to magnify the word, not because it's talking about many, but to say this is great, this is exalted, this is glorious. And so you use the plural to emphasize that. And the reason we know that it needs to be singular, translated instead of plural, is because the next word created in the Hebrew is a singular verb. Now, when you have a singular verb, you need a singular subject. And so it's not intended to say there's many, many gods, but it's a great magnified God. However, the plural God acting singularly in created suggests a plurality in the Godhead. And that is later brought out in Genesis 1 in verse 26 where God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Who is this plurality? Well, the first of this plurality that we're introduced to is the Spirit of God. The very next verse. The earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Here's the first time we come across that word spirit. It's a word that in the Greek, when the Greek uses that word in the New Testament, it's often translated ghost. Now that might be good enough in 1611 to communicate the idea of that word, but it doesn't work very well for us today. And most modern translations are going to use the word spirit instead of ghost. Now there is a word for ghost in the Greek. And you find it in Matthew 14, 26 and Mark 6 and verse 49. Two accounts of the same event where the apostles see Jesus walking on the water and in the King James Version they say, it is a spirit. Well, that's where they should have used the word ghost. The Greek word is phantasma. And I put that up there. And doesn't that sound like to you like the word phantom? It should, because that's where we get the word phantom from. But that's not a word ever used to refer to God. In John 4 and verse 24, where it says God is a spirit, it's a different word. It's the word pneuma. Now, you might be familiar with a pneumatic conveyor. You know what that is? You convey things by air, a pneumatic conveyor. It blows through the pipe and carries things with it. You're familiar with the word pneumonia. It has to do with your breath, doesn't it? That word pneuma means not just spirit, it's the same word with a different meaning. It also means wind or breath. And that's true in the Greek New Testament. That is also true in the Hebrew Old Testament for the word they use for spirit. When you think of the spirit of God, instead of thinking of a ghost, you need to think of wind or breath. God is a spirit. God's not a ghost. Now, come to Genesis 1 and verse 2 and think about that. And it's easy to imagine, isn't it? Easy to see the, the wind of God blowing across dark, cold waters, isn't it? But that's not the picture. Because it says the Spirit of God moved. And the word moved is a word of volition. The wind doesn't have volition, but God does. And though the translators did well to catch that, 
and translate that word spirit there instead of wind. The spirit is like the wind in that it is powerful and it is active, but it is unseen. Now, this idea of the plurality and the Godhead is in the Old Testament, but it becomes clarified when we come to the New Testament. Let me show you some passages. Luke 1 and verse 35. When the angel comes to Mary and says, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall oversaddle thee, and that holy thing that shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Here we have the Holy Spirit, the highest, and the Son of God. We come to Matthew 3, 13 through 17, the baptism of Jesus. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee unto Jordan to be baptized in him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove. And a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son. Here we have a Son and a Father, and between them the Spirit, don't we? All right, let's look at John 16, 13 through 16, when it says, Jesus says, when he, the spirit of truth, has come. But then he said, he'll guide you in all truth a little while and you shall not see me. And again, a little while and you shall see me because I go to the Father. You have the Son going to the Father and the Spirit coming to the apostles, the three we come to Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations and baptizing them in the name. Now that's singular, not the names. In the name, one name with three persons. The name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. King James Version, probably better translated there, the Holy Spirit to give us a better idea. And then we come to Acts chapter 2, verses 33 through 36. And Peter preaches, Therefore by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. David's not ascended into heavens, but he said himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus, whom you've crucified, both the Lord and Christ. We have the Father and the Spirit and the Son. Now, the Holy Spirit is God. In all these references, he's spoken of God just as the Father has spoken of God and just as the Son has spoken of God. And I think this is brought out so clear. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 1, a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. And Peter said... Ananias, why have Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? That'd be the Holy Spirit. And to keep back part of the price of the land. The next verse. While it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why have thou conceived this thing in thy heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. When they lied to the Holy Spirit, they were lying unto God. Because the Holy Spirit is God. He has the nature of God. The pagans, their idea of God was many, many gods of, of various, various powers and various ranks and the great God and the gods under them and they're all in conflict and contending with one another and you try to get on the good side of the God on the winning side at the time and that was the pagan theology. So different in the New Testament. One God, one divine nature. This nature 
This one divine nature is all-powerful, all-knowing, and eternal. And they are united in thought and in purpose and in action. And the Holy Spirit has that one divine nature and shares it with the Father and the Son. We read in Hebrews 9, 13 through 14, going on down to the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot unto God. He, the spirit is eternal, as is the Father and the Son, because the spirit has that one divine nature. Now, here's three things that we can know about the Holy Spirit. And these three things are fundamental, and it's three things about which there is hardly any controversy. The, the passages through the Scriptures that mention the Holy Spirit, sometimes you think, well, now, does it mean this or does it mean that when it's referring to the Holy Spirit? Is it, is it talking about the Spirit working this way or the Spirit working that way? And, there, and there's different opinions and ideas, and, and sometimes it's based on, well, it's, there's simply false doctrine behind some of the spins people will put on some of these Holy Spirit passages. But on these three things... There's almost universal agreement. And that is that the Holy Spirit gave us the word. And the Holy Spirit empowered men to confirm that this was the word. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost when Peter spoke. Look what you see in here. This comes from God. And then the Holy Spirit works through the word to reach us. Now, people up in Kentucky and before the Revolutionary War and different places, they think the Holy Spirit works all different kind of ways. But even then, they all would agree the Spirit works through the Word. And so that's where the focus is going to be in that meeting is explaining those three things. If we understand those three things about the Spirit's work and involvement with the Word, we'll understand some of the unique nature of how the Holy Spirit works. Now remember this. The Holy Spirit is God. When God works... The Father is involved, and the Son is involved, and the Spirit is involved. They're all working together, and they do not necessarily tell man all the ways that they go about doing their work, just that God does things, and we, by faith, accept it. But when it comes to the Word, there are some specific things about what the Holy Spirit is doing. Ephesians 6 and verse 17 Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Why is it called the Word of God? Because the Spirit of God gave us that Word. And why is it called the sword of the Spirit? Because the Spirit of God works through that Word. And so that's where the attention is going to be given. When we think of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit... The Son is the most accessible. We understand the Son. He became one of us. You ever been weary? You know the Son was weary. You ever been hungry? You know the Son was hungry. He was thirsty. He was angry. He was joyful. He was fatigued. He bore all the infirmities of the flesh and was tried in all ways like we are tried. And we can relate to that. Through the Son, we can relate to the Father and understand God. Because John 14, 9 says, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. You want to know if the Father cares about you? Look at the Son. The gift He gave the agony he suffered. And God did that for us, God the Father. But what about the Holy Spirit? 
There's no statement like this about the Holy Spirit. Of the three, the Son is presented to us in a clarity. Through Him we see the Father, but further back behind Him is the Spirit. And it says in John 16, 13 through 14, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He'll guide you into all truth, for He shall not speak of Himself. He shall glorify me. The Holy Spirit is not so much revealing himself to us in this word that he gave. He's revealing the Son to us that we might know the Father. And so this is the most difficult for us to, to grasp the Spirit. And that must be then by, the, by design. How do we honor the Holy Spirit? We honor the Holy Spirit by honoring what He told us about the Son. Jesus has become the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey Him. It's through the Spirit that we have this knowledge of the Son of God that shows us the Father. If you want to bring honor to the Holy Spirit, you honor His Word and what is revealed in His Word, and follow His Word. And that will bring that honor to the Spirit. Now, as we bring that, the Holy Spirit wants you to be a Christian. And He's going to move you in your heart to do that. If you'll open His heart to His teachings, it's the most powerful teachings that are here on this earth, and they're filled with power. We've got to receive them into our hearts. And if we'll receive the Word of God and turn from every other way and confess our faith in Christ and be baptized in Him, we'll be added to God's church. And that's what the Holy Spirit desires of us. If you need to respond to that invitation, then do it while we stand and sing.